Welcome back to Master the Marketplace with Caspian. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to another episode of uh, Master the Marketplace with Caspian. Very excited to have a special guest on our show today, CJ from AmazonSellersLawyer.com, founder and managing partner. CJ, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you very much for having me on. I'm really, really excited to have this conversation with you guys. Perfect. And we've got our Director of Compliance, Jed Nelson, with us from Caspian as well. And we're going to talk today about uh, compliance on the Amazon marketplace and about protecting your brand. And I can't, uh, I can't be more excited to have the two folks, both on my end as well as CJ on the show, to talk more about that. So let's get started to just uh, with some introductions. Uh, so CJ, why don't you start and tell us a little bit about your firm, a little bit about yourself. We'd just love to learn a little bit about your background. Well, I got to tell you something. I have the world's greatest team, okay? Uh, I consider myself to be reasonably bright, but my team behind me is absolutely tremendous. Uh, my partner, Rob Siegel, runs our brand protection practice. I've got an awesome partner, Anthony Familaro, who has helped reinstate more Amazon accounts and more Amazon listings than anybody on earth. Uh, Neil Flynn, who is running our litigation unit, is a tremendous friend of mine since we were eight years old and a super accomplished lawyer. We've got David Miller, business law for sellers, and I've got Travis Stockman, and just a whole host of extremely well-educated, driven people um, who do nothing but focus on helping uh, people and companies who are selling their products on Amazon. Fantastic. Great. And then, Jed, why don't you introduce yourself as well? Tell everyone a little bit about you know what you do at Caspian. Yeah, so I'm the director of compliance here at Caspian. I've been with Etails for eight years. Uh, started out actually in customer service and worked my way all the way through um, helping out start the warehouse and in compliance for the last four plus years. Uh, at e at uh, uh, Caspian, keep on uh, learning uh, with the, the name change, uh, going back to the old Etails ways. Um, but uh, at Caspian, we manage hundreds of thousands of products on a regular basis, uh, including managing the compliance uh, on Amazon which changes, as, as you know, CJ, on a regular basis. They're constantly putting out new rules and, and doing new things. Um, and so it's, it's always a, a challenge to stay one step ahead of, uh, of what's happening there. When I'm not doing stuff at Caspian, uh, I'm also an officer in the Army National Guard um, here in Washington. Fantastic, great. So like I mentioned, you know, we're gonna talk about you know, brand protecting, protection on Amazon. We're gonna talk about compliance on the platform. So Jed, why don't you take it away? I mean, you're the director of compliance. Ask a few questions to CJ. Get you know, pick his brain. You know, get some information from this guy. Definitely. Uh, so CJ, uh, I've never met you, but I've been following you for about four years on uh, LinkedIn, and uh, and the content you put out is fantastic. So um, and it's been very helpful to the team here. So it's it's kind of a, a privilege to get a chance to interview you. Well, I gotta tell you something. I, I feel the same way, and I, I can't. Uh, being part of the National Guard and Caspian is just absolutely huge. So we can have a whole brother love fest right now. Uh, but I hold you guys also both in extremely high regards. And uh, that intro, uh, saying that about me really means a lot. But it really is the team behind us uh, that makes us great. Awesome. So uh, kind of jumping in some of the questions. Uh, we've seen Amazon doing a lot of enforcement um, really since the whole COVID thing started. There's been a lot of changes. What kind of trends have you been tracking and seeing uh, over the last several months as, as Amazon's been struggling to adapt to this new, uh, new environment? All right, well, the first thing we saw is an explosion, an absolute explosion of the price gouging slash fair market pricing accusations. Mm -hmm. And it was just off the charts. And Amazon was getting notified by state attorney generals all over the United States your price gouging, your price gouging. So what did Amazon do? Amazon sent all these attorney generals spreadsheets of all the sellers selling the products. And guess who was left off every single one? Amazon retail. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So we worked with attorney generals around the country and with Amazon sellers to make sure they didn't put anything in the plan of action that would blow up in their face negotiated with the attorney generals around the United States and resolved all of them. Um, 
since that time, since that all kind of petered out, I guess about two months or so ago, we're seeing a lot more brand protection efforts in terms of large brands doing a lot of bad stuff against smaller sellers. And on the positive front, we're seeing a lot of sellers who develop private label brands that have now grown into really legitimate brands using the same tools, but they're legitimately protecting their brands. And it, that I think is absolutely tremendous because like, you know, in, in the decades prior, goodwill was the value of any business. Okay. It was the goodwill that you sold when you wanted to retire. Now it's intellectual property rights. Mm -hmm. And I love that sellers all over the world are developing their own brands. We're here to protect their sales and help them develop it. So we're seeing a lot more of, more of that from both sides of the fence. Definitely. Uh, I've seen that you've posted quite a bit of stuff about Boris and some of the tactics that they've taken. Um, what would be a good way to, uh, to, to go about protecting your intellectual property rights on Amazon versus what some of these other uh, firms have been doing? All right. Boris in particular and the other companies out there, uh, what they do is, is buckshot. It's almost as if it's automated. They send the letter out with all sorts of baseless claims. And they'll also sprinkle in some claims that might have some validity. Mm -hmm. What we recommend for the development is first, make sure you have intellectual property rights. Okay. If you don't have a trademark yet, use Amazon's IP accelerator program. And not only will you get the application for your trademark into the USPTO, but those lawyers who are in bed with Amazon will get you brand registry within days. Mm -hmm. Unlike other law firms like us, where it'll take nine months. So make sure you get a trademark, make sure you get brand registry, number one. Um, the second step is making sure that there's something with your product, either um, the storage of the product, the warranty, participating in recall, some added benefit to buying your product from an authorized seller that an unauthorized seller cannot deliver. That takes your product outside of the first sale doctrine, which means not everybody can sell it. And that gives us and you the tools to protect your sales. Intellectual property rights and something that differentiates the delivery or the receipt of the product so that other people, even if they have genuine products, can't steal your sales. Awesome. So if, if you're a seller out there and you uh, you get a whole bunch of goods and you don't have a direct relationship and you get hit with one of these cease and desist letters, um, what would you advise them to do? Okay, first thing you got to do is have somebody who knows something about intellectual property law, take a look at it and decide and figure out whether you are or are not actually violating anybody's rights. You wouldn't believe how many even large brands with legal departments make baseless complaints. <laughs> OK, you wouldn't believe how many times like you are delivering exactly the same thing as the brand. So someone has to look at it. It can't be like one of these consultants out there. It doesn't have to be us, but it certainly has to be a lawyer who knows something about intellectual property. So they have to do the evaluation. Are you violating their rights or are you not? Right. So once you come to that decision, then you're going to approach that brand to get that complaint retracted. And of course, your, your negotiating is different if you are not violating versus if you are. Makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, kind of maybe uh, shifting back to what kind of what you're talking about with the price gouging and whatnot. Uh, a lot of brands are worried now. Um, they see their costs increasing. They're competing in the market, you know, uh, and they would like to raise prices. But given the, the scares that occurred, um, they're worried about doing that. How would you advise them to maybe um, to think about that and potentially be able to raise their prices in a way that doesn't trigger Amazon's algorithms or an investigation by an attorney general? Um, number one, if you're going to raise your prices, you want to do it incrementally. OK, you don't want to go from like five dollars for a pack of 50 masks to 500. OK, you also may not want to do it on products that the public absolutely needs at any given point in time. Mm -hmm. Second. It, the laws that are written in each state are, are, are different, but it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure it out. So pull up the price gouging laws in your state and just look through it. A lot of times you don't even need a lawyer to read it. You'll see it. Um, some states, for example, will look at what are the replacement costs, right? And if the replacement costs 
skyrocketed and your price has skyrocketed, there's no price gouging. Okay. Yeah. Others wanted to see a relationship between prior history of sales. So those might be problematic. And each state is a, is a little bit different. Uh, but I would say first, start DIY, do it yourself. Google the price gouging laws in your state. And if you can't figure it out, then maybe get a lawyer to look at it. We looked at about, I don't know, 20 different states' laws, and we kept a chart what is and what is not price gouging. Mm -hmm. um, also, a lot of the laws were written way back in the 70s when, when the oil embargo was going on, right? Like, I remember me and my buddies uh, were selling water bottles to the cars online waiting for gas, okay? <laughs> And so a lot of them only apply to petroleum products and they were trying to now extend it to hand sanitizer, mm -hmm. right? So um, you gotta really just take a quick look. If, if it's really crystal clear, sellers will see it for themselves. If it's a little more obtuse, then get a lawyer to take a quick look at it. We've read so many of these and we can figure out what literally in like five minutes when it's, when it's clear. Uh, but that's the first you want to check the law in your state to see if you are or not generally you're not going to be price gouging makes sense makes sense uh yeah, and then, sorry. really long-winded man i'm really sorry about that <laughs> no, no like worries. Good. uh one that we've seen a couple of times is uh is shipping costs so shipping a you know a, a case of water from washington to florida costs a pretty penny um and uh, and it's hard to compete online and, and be able to sell that um and uh well if you're drop shipping the product it costs even more than if you use an fba um, how should someone, a seller, think about maybe selling those types of products and, and avoiding these types of complaints on, against those? You know, we saw water causing complaints back after one of the hurricanes. So in terms of the per unit cost, you certainly don't want to include the shipping cost in your pricing. Okay. And uh, it's, a, it, it's certainly a problem on Amazon. Off Amazon, it's easy. Here's the price plus shipping and handling. You can't really do that on Amazon. So when it comes to something like that, I would probably tell a seller, don't get involved in it, okay? Avoid it. You may lose a few bucks on the short term, but you're going to protect your business long term. Because in, in that case, it can be very, very difficult to avoid, at least in some states. And a lot of states look at as to where the products arrived um, and whether those states even have jurisdiction over you is another issue. But if it's like water after a hurricane, Stay away and make a few bucks someplace else. Look at the long haul game. Absolutely. No, that's good advice. Uh, middle of a different question. With Congress debating the Shop Safe Act and taking a harder look at big tech's business practices, what additional requirements or, or issues do you foresee for brands and sellers uh, coming down the pipeline? You know, when it comes for sellers, I'm really hopeful that America will eventually catch up with India <laughs> and not allow Amazon to own the marketplace and also sell. Or uh, my partner, Anthony Famalauer, testified in front of the California State Legislature, uh, I guess about a year and a half, two years ago, at least stop Amazon from using your data to then get into your products. Uh, so I'm kind of hopeful that this will help sellers over the long haul. Uh, but again, Ma Bell took you know, decades and decades to, to, to get under control. So we're not looking at anything happening anytime soon. At least that, that's my anticipation. Yeah. And CJ, maybe for our, for our viewers, for our listeners, just explain the difference between the situation in India that you that you outlined and and here in the United States, and why you know what what's the advantages and disadvantages of those? Okay, so in India, the India government passed a law that said you can't own the marketplace and also sell, right? It's, so Amazon owns the marketplace. They can't sell themselves in India. Here in the United States, Amazon is not only allowed to sell, but also influence who sells, who gets the buy box, keep it all secret, no transparency, and yet control absolutely every aspect of selling on Amazon, which leads to another legal battle that's going on in California right now with Amazon. But that's the difference. India said if you own the marketplace, you can't sell. And I think that was great. It was a really good thing of the Indian government to do to grow industry within the country and grow the sellers within India without having to compete against Bezos and his army. Great. Okay, Jed, back to you. Yep. Uh, 
So do you think that Amazon, as it as uh, they're discussing some of the, the Shop Safe Act rules, and I think California is also working on some similar legislation that would uh, move product liability um, back onto Amazon as the platform. Do you think that's going to impact sellers, or do you think that that's going to, to be something that Amazon's going to just accept? Kind of a little uh, Well, I'm not so sure how it'll affect Amazon sellers, okay? Um, except to continue Amazon's monopolistic tendencies and control over everybody. So here, here's the story with that. And listen, before becoming the world's greatest team at writing plans of action and appeal and doing all the other stuff, I was a personal injury trial lawyer. Okay. So Amazon, yeah, you can laugh. I'm cool with it. I love chasing those ambulances. I love trying cases. Okay. So here's the story. Anybody or any company that controls the product has responsibility or liability when someone gets hurt, okay? Amazon exerts tremendous control over inventory, control, sales, listing, prices, shipping, customer service, the A to Z warranty. I mean, there's very few aspects of being a retailer on Amazon that Amazon doesn't control. When you exert control, you have liability. That's been the law all over the United States, you know, for, for, for a, a decades. Okay, since product liability began, if you control the product, you were responsible if it hurt somebody. So Amazon lost that battle. It was nothing new to anybody who knows anything about product liability law. What Amazon's trying to do now is they're trying to get these smaller platforms to be compelled to have the same responsibility, even though Etsy and eBay control nothing about the sellers or the products. Mm -hmm. So they're really trying to stick it to those smaller platforms since Amazon has the liability and the cost. They're trying to make everybody else who can't afford it and doesn't take the same control to get stuck with the same liability. I think it's gonna absolutely fail, uh, but you know, you never know, right? Uh, being a, uh, a former plaintiff's lawyer, you know, increased responsibility. I don't really think is necessarily a bad thing. I just don't like that Amazon is doing it solely to increase the monopolistic power in the marketplace. Yeah, so that makes sense. Do you think that uh, if Amazon starts taking on more of these costs, they might require uh, their, well, they actually do require sellers to have insurance. It's, it's in their business solutions agreement. But in many cases, like, I doubt that they're verifying that they have it or even that they're a legitimate business. We've seen multiple times where they can't produce the seller when there's a, a lawsuit filed. They said, well, we can't find them. You got to go find them if you want to go sue them. Um, do you think there might be any other changes like that that they might be introducing into the platform? Well, if, if Amazon continues down this path, um, I, I think they will start enforcing the requirement to have insurance, okay? And if there's any seller out there and you don't already have uh, insurance behind you, general liability insurance, contact Ashlyn Haddon in Indianapolis. She is the world leader when it comes to selling insurance to people in e-commerce. Um, the cost of it is really low and it gives you something that most people don't realize. Like everybody knows, right? If you have an accident and you have insurance, they're going to pay for the person that got hurt. Everybody knows that. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to business liability, the biggest thing you need is someone to pay the lawyers, okay? <laughs> and to me, that is more important than the indemnification or paying for the injury. It's defending you. And that's what insurance provides. It covers indemnification, which covers whoever got hurt, their damages, the house burned down, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But they also are required to defend you. And that means providing you with a lawyer. And if you've ever been sued and you did not have insurance, you're looking at an easy five or ten thousand dollars just to retain somebody, and the meter's going to run forever. Where if you have insurance and you contact Ashlyn like I'm telling you to do, all you do is you pick up your phone and you say, "Hey Ashlyn, there's some nonsense going on. I'm being sued. Can you put this through?" And then Ashlyn will arrange for the insurance company to send lawyers to re represent you. And that is a huge benefit and also allow you to sleep at night on top of being in compliant with the TOS. Absolutely. Makes sense. Um, 
So Amazon has a bit of a counterfeit problem. Uh, and uh, so they've announced Project Zero, they've hired some big names, they've done a lot more enforcement and whatnot. Um, what kind of, uh, how do you feel like this enforcement's really affecting uh, sellers and is it really working in your opinion? Okay, let me divide it up, okay? Then we got Amazon as a counterfeiter, right? <laughs> then we got third party sellers as a counterfeiter, okay? So third party sellers generally don't want any part of counterfeit products. There's no significant savings at the factories. It know, they know they're putting their business at risk. They know brand protection is through the roof, okay? So are there counterfeiters? Of course there are. But the problem with third party sellers being counterfeiters is nowhere near uh, what the propaganda leads people to believe. Most third party sellers want no part of counterfeit goods. They will get stuck with them just like everybody else from time to time, but it's not something that's in the business model. And we've helped thousands, if not tens of thousands of sellers all over the world, okay? Now, let's talk about Amazon selling counterfeit products, okay? So I, I don't know exactly how broad the problem is, but I can tell you that we were engaged in an arbitration against Amazon for an Amazon vendor who was 100% selling counterfeit products to Amazon. And Amazon, a thousand percent, knew it was buying counterfeit products and then selling them to the public. And in this case, there was 160 or so different complaints that the products were counterfeit, okay? And Amazon kept selling them anyway. And Amazon, kept selling the products even though they had tier one management contracts with the brands. And the brands were the ones who would receive the products, reach out to Amazon and submitted some of those complaints. So what does Amazon do? They, they stop paying the vendor, okay? They sell counterfeit products. Amazon keeps selling the products to the consumers, keeps collecting the money. Now they're getting the products for nothing because they're not even paying for the counterfeit products. Amazon then reaches out to the same vendor and says, hey, if you open up another account, we can keep buying from you. Holy heck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's crazy, right? Yeah. So he does. And he's making a boatload of money. Amazon is knowingly buying counterfeit. Amazon is knowingly selling counterfeit. And then where they, they stop paying again. So now they're making huge profits. Then they go to our guy a third time. It's like, hey, why don't you open an account in Australia? Right? And we'll start buying from you again. And our guy's finally like, no, you owe me $2 million. So we went to arbitration on this, and it was bad guy versus bad guy. Okay, Amazon, our guy was selling counterfeit. Amazon was knowingly buying and selling counterfeit. And we tried to persuade the arbitrator to make Amazon pay uh, for the goods. You know, unfortunately, we lost, but we uncovered so much information uh, that I think the case was worthwhile because I think Amazon vendors need to know, never let Amazon owe you so much money that you'll go out of business. Mm -hmm. And I think that third party sellers have a right to know that while the, you know, Amazon's accusing them of bad stuff, Amazon does it too. Makes sense. Crazy story, right? Oh, very crazy story. Crazy. Um, yeah. Uh, so do you do much uh, in, in the international markets or, or have any advice for sellers who might be looking to expand internationally um, with where the best places are and, and kind of how to, to think about that overall? 100%. And by the way, I'm not an Amazon basher. I think Amazon has provided uh, people and companies that one of the, the greatest opportunity in, in commerce ever in the history of commerce. Right. Okay. I mean, where else could anybody but like, you know, a credit card right, and a cell phone, get into international business. So tremendous, very grateful for our sellers, even though that last story kind of, you know, uh, <laughs> I wasn't so kind to Amazon. So I would say absolutely yes. I would look at the UK first, since it's not as frightening because it's in English, then Germany and then Japan. When it comes to Japan, the products have to be simpler and sort of smaller in size and less flamboyant to be successful. The Japanese market, doesn't seem to to uh, respond favorably to tons and tons of choices 
right? It's more uh, utilitarian from what I'm seeing, but I would absolutely recommend it. And I'd also recommend um, if you're building a business and you want it to be worth seven figures, eight figures, you know, diversify, get on the other platforms, even though the market share is minimal. And uh, eBay in particular makes it really easy to sell in a boatload of countries. So that, that's what I'd recommend. Absolutely go international, absolutely go international on Amazon, uh, but also diversify in terms of building the value of the business. Speaking of other platforms, do you think that those other platforms are going to face some of the same types of issues that Amazon's faced um, over time? Or do you think that they're like, for instance, Walmart is doing a better job um, in building its, its platform uh, to, to kind of counteract some of the issues we see on Amazon? You know, Walmart um, was the, the whole story was they had a lot of smart money behind it was that they were going to develop a platform that was kinder and better to sellers and also had some geographical savings for sellers to get their products to the consumers. I wish they had taken off a bit faster. I don't think they're necessarily going to have the same issues that Amazon has for the long term because Amazon has a big target on its back for being so monopolistic. And I don't really know if the owning the Washington Post in an era of Republican control is really the best thing in the world. Fair point, fair point. Well, those are the questions that I had prepared. Um, Kanal, did you have anything you wanted to follow up on? Yeah, I had, I had one question for you, CJ, really around, you know, we saw this, this surge in demand, you know, going into this year, which none of us expected, you know, in, in the market, especially as it relates to Amazon. What's your predictions for what's next? You know, we have an election coming up. We've got a change in the economic conditions. But how does the next one, two, three, four, five years look for you? You know, I think Amazon is going to continue to grow tremendously. I think if you're selling retail, you have to be on Amazon. It's a great opportunity, even though it has some problems with it. Um, unfortunately, I think there is going to be uh, a second wave if we ever get through the first wave of the coronavirus. And when schools shut down again and people are home, the only shopping that's going to go on is going to be online and Amazon, you know, 60, 70 percent of every dollar, I think, is going to be there. Um, so I, I think, unfortunately, um, our country is going to go through some more closures. I think the world is going to experience some more pain and deaths, which really suck. Um, so as a retailer, I think you have to be on Amazon. No, no way of fans or buts. Um, if you watch the stock market at all, Practically every day, Amazon stock goes up. I mean, every day. Right. Um, and I think that's because of the control of the marketplace. Um, will it ultimately result in Amazon getting split up like Ma Bell um, in, the, in the 80s, I think it was? Um, eventually, it probably will. But for now, for the next you know, one to five years, you have got to get on Amazon. You have got to develop your own brand on Amazon. And uh, I think it's the way to go. There's a lot of money to be made in retail. Also, it is 1,000% remote, right? So uh, I'd also recommend to traditional retailers, you know, like the guy across the street from me who sells sneakers and T-shirts, you know, he should be online. He should be opening up an Amazon account because people are afraid to walk into his store. So I think for the, the near term as well as the long term, you got to get in the game. And do you think, CJ, that there's a new consumer that was potentially created as part of you know, some of this? You know, an example someone gave me recently was, well, for the first time, someone probably experienced a package coming to their doorstep in two days. And, you know, now they're a new avid fan of Amazon. Do you think there's a new consumer potentially created as part of all of this? You know, I hadn't thought about that, but you're right. You know, my, my parents, for example, are in their 70s, had a health issue in Florida, had to go back and forth a couple of times. And now, you know, they're not going out. They're not risking getting sick. And usually it was me and my sister sending them stuff through Amazon. OK, but now they're ordering themselves. So, yeah, I do think generationally the market's going to grow. And there are consumers who, you know, always preferred to go in. Like when I go to a supermarket, I never use self-checkout because I believe people need jobs. When I go to an airport, I never use the kiosks. I always go up to the desk. But, you know, now people have been compelled to shop from home. So I do think I think there's a tremendous number of, of new uh, consumers who are going to land online and are going to land on Amazon's doorstep. Excellent. 
Oh well, yeah, that was kind of it. So CJ, I want to thank you again for coming onto our onto our show today. It was a pleasure to have you. Just to wrap things up, where can people find you? How should they contact you? Could you just give our viewers a little bit about you know how do we get in touch with you? All right. So the website is AmazonSellersLawyer.com. Sellers is plural. Lawyer is singular. AmazonSellersLawyer.com. Also, listen, I'm old school guy. I'm almost always the <laughs> oldest guy in the room. So you can call, right? And, and we pick up the phone seven days a week, okay? And the number is 877-9-SELLER, 877-9-SELLER. And I make, it, I make sure that we are available to sellers because I know um, when an Amazon seller has an issue, it's like the most stressful thing in the world that all of a sudden your livelihood is down especially if Amazon's wrong. So we make it a point to be available seven days a week, uh, weekdays from 9 a.m. New York time to the close of business in California, uh, weekends 10 to 5. But we're here seven days a week. And um, if you have any issue at all, even just need someone to vent to or get some free advice, reach out to us. We have boatloads of free content on our website. Uh, we are absolutely devoted to sellers. So, uh, AmazonSellersLawyer.com and 877-9-SELLERS. Fantastic. Well, thank you again, CJ, for coming to the show. Thank you, Jed, for being here and being a great interviewer. And uh, everyone, we will see you again very soon on another episode of Masters of the Marketplace. So till then, goodbye and see you next time. Through conversations with experts in online retail, with years of marketing, compliance, and inventory management experience, we seek to empower our listeners to master the marketplace. Thanks for listening. We hope to see you next time on Master the Marketplace with Caspian.